Welcome to the official YouTube channel for the Colin Coward Podcast. Go on, hit the subscribe button. There you go, right down there. If you wanna be among the first to hear my weekly takes, NFL, college football, more, right there. All right, as is customary, it's Sunday night. John Middlecoff and I chop it up for about an hour. Uh, mostly things NFL. I will say, is I was in Chicago over the weekend, my favorite really, really downtown area in North America. There's other cities I like, but uh, I was dancing at midnight with my wife last night. So, you know, if I'm a little, if I'm a little uneven today, I, we tied one on last night. It was good. I slept on the plane and got, by the way, American Airlines, I'll say it again. I flew it again, John. I'm going to have, I'm going to have an airline affair. I was a Delta guy forever, but um, third flight American. What do you fly by the way? Uh, well, the West Coast, I usually go Southwest, yep. but it, it go across country, usually American or United. But, uh, you know, from S Scottsdale to Sacramento to the Bay Area to Southern California, the Southwest is just a couple hundred bucks yep. in and out. It's you hop on the plane, yep. go. You're, you're not there long. I never check a bag. Yeah. Uh, I, I also tied one on, but it started in the day. I went to the Dodger game. You, you talk about, I mean, Colin, I heard you mention this yeah. the other day. You go to a Dodger game. Otani didn't even play. I mean, they are an all-star yep. team. There had to be 20,000 people there. You're waiting 25 minutes for a margarita. The, the vibes at spring training for these teams, especially the Dodgers, it's a remarkable experience. It was it was fun. Now, the guys, you know, Mookie Betts and those guys come af out after five or six innings. But talk about a guy. I mean, they, they got Otani who pitches and hits. Mookie Betts plays second, shortstop, and all the outfield <laughs> positions. And then there's Freddie Freeman. And I looked at their line. Yeah, They're I looked good. at their lineup I think yesterday, their spring lineup, and I listened to the Dodgers uh, here, here in Southern California on radio. And I was I had a guest on recently. We talked about that. I don't know if it helps baseball, but it, just in terms of lineup, it, it's got a 1975 Cincinnati Reds when it was Rose, Morgan, Foster, Johnny Bench, Tony Perez. Like, they're just all-stars everywhere. Now, it all comes down, as you know, in baseball, it all comes down to the healthier staff. If your if staff can't get out, it doesn't matter how many guys, position players are great. But, no, I had a, a guy on my staff, Greg Tui, big, big baseball fan. His kids play baseball. He said he went to a Padres game. Padres have an all-star team. They got big names, walked right in. Dodgers, minute he came in to sitting down, was like a 45-minute experience. Crazy. was an absolute zoo. It, it felt like now they share with the White Sox. And you can go with spring training and watch people practice. I mean, they got 18 fields yeah. out there. It, it, it felt like 50,000 people in the parking lot, like an SEC football game or something. It was it was quite the – I went to a Dodger game last year, and it felt, I would say, 2, 3x, the buzz, you know, just the vibes. Otani didn't even play, and you never know in spring when a guy's going to play or not. So you just kind of show up hoping. A lot of Otani jerseys. I mean, you talk about – that guy moves the needle. Listen, football – you see all the, the money flowing in this sport. Right. Every team has it. In baseball, obviously, there's the haves yeah. and the have-nots. I grew up a big Giants guy. I'm supposed to hate these guys. They're a well-run operation well, right now. Well, think about Dodgers. this, too. They average seven. The Dodgers average 7,000 more people per game than any other team. And they're not charging Cincinnati red prices for beer. I go to a Dodger game every yeah. year. It is. And, again, it is the best – $18 for a margarita yesterday. What am I going to do? Not pay? I want a, I want a cocktail. <laughs> they are they are just a bank. And then they push all this money down the road. So, yeah, oh. I mean, they've, they've kind of done the ultimate. It's like money ball, but with real money. Like at money ball, they've, they've kind of figured <laughs> out how to work the system. <laughs> exactly. um, so let, let's start with this. So Mac Jones only goes for a six round pick. So first of all, it's, it's 75% of first round quarterbacks don't make it. Uh, very rarely Sam Darnold got a second team to start for Justin Fields may, uh, you know, Mac Jones isn't, I thought it was a little low if Trey Lance goes for a four and I'm not sure he can play at all. I kept thinking to myself. So Mac Jones was a high school, all American quarterback, a uh, college, all American quarterback and rookie of the year his first year. How much of it is the dude can't play and how much of it is. This was a bad spot with a coach that appeared to be tone deaf to offense and a little bit of a grudge holder. Do you think he can play at all? Well, I was never a fan. And that was, goes back to when the four in terms of drafting yeah. him really high, because when you draft a guy in the top 15, you got to pay him a decent yeah. amount of money. There are a lot of variables of this. And first off, I like this deal for the Jags six round pick for a backup yes. quarterback. It makes two and a half yeah. million dollars. He got traded for less than Trey Lance though. 
and he's accomplished way more than Trey Lance as a full-time starter in the league because his contract, right? His They're not going to pick up his fifth-year option, which is going to be well over $20 million. So you're basically just tra- trading for one year of his services. And then you never know. Maybe Trevor Lawrence gets hurt and he's good and you get, you know, strike oil. I was thinking about this today, though, Colin, and this is why I'm a big believer. When you draft guys really high, there is no such thing as a high floor. It it doesn't exist, right? you like, this guy, he's going to be Kirk Cousins, or maybe he's just not going to be that good, right? It's why I had no problem taking big swings on Zach Wilson and Trey Lance, because the likelihood of the guy, you're trying to hit a home run no matter what. At best, Mac Jones was always going to be a stand-up double, maybe rounding second, looking at third, but he was never even going to be a triple. His best case scenario is going to be a fringe top 10 quarterback. And that's if everything went perfectly. And I I, I don't know. I, I just, it, I think it's very telling that Gerard Mayo is a former player, spent a lot of time around Tom Brady, has been there this whole Mac Jones experience. And it's clearly like, right. I don't want this guy around. Let's face it. Part of Mac Jones was, okay, he's going to be like Cousins or yeah. Jared Goff. What do those guys have in spades? Character, focus. This guy was kind of viewed pretty yeah. immature. Right. That that to me was a huge red flag that I, I didn't quite see coming. But that that came to roost really quick with some of his like, come on, Mac, let's, well, let's get mean, it together. Listen, buddy. Jay Cutler was really gifted and he wore people out. Uh, I mean, Jay is the best bear quarterback in a long time uh, and, and Jay yeah. won games. But at the end, people just didn't like Jay Cutler. They were just they just I mean, Aaron Rodgers, Green Bay said, yeah, hit the road. I mean, that's essentially what Green Bay did at the end. So if you don't have yeah. Jay Cutler or Aaron Rodgers gifts and you are just, I mean, you can go back and look at his first year. He, it, it, Listen, he is a kid that played sort of in a pro offense down in Alabama with really good people where, so you can argue Bama had better players than offensively, at least skill position players than New England. I don't even think that's, that's not even arguable. Well, he played with four wide receivers that got drafted in the top 15. <laughs> so, And I think what happens is, but his personality, people put up with a lot of shit if you're gifted. It, it, it could be our business. It could be the NFL. If you're not gifted, you got to – that's why most of these quarterbacks are good guys because this league just doesn't – this is not the NBA. There's no nine-year contracts like baseball. And in the NBA where marginal guys have no-cut deals, you, you just you – just, you're – see ya. Hit the road if you're not a stand-up guy. And I think Mac came with a reputation that he was a bit of a brat. I, I was told by somebody I trust, I was told this last year, and this is somebody that is a great source. He said, you couldn't coach him hard. You just couldn't coach him hard. Brady got annoyed with it after about 15, 20 years of it, but you could coach him hard. Yeah. Uh, like Mac, you couldn't. He pouted, uh, petty, and there was just, you know, it just that's what I heard. And when I heard that, I'm like, well, that's the wrong culture. That That's all they do in New England. But he came from that in Alabama. It's not like Nick Saban was holding his hand, right? So he, that, I think Bill always felt comfortable drafting an urban guy, drafting a Saban guy, because those coaches were in their players, you know, in their face, 24-7, 365. And it turns out, listen, we can make excuses for Mac a couple years ago with the Patricia Joe Judge embarrassment, and it was – but last year, he had Bill O'Brien, and he constantly was throwing the ball to the other team. And, and confidence is a powerful thing for any yeah. young person. He clearly lost it. But like you said, Jay Cutler and Aaron Rodgers throw a better ball with their left hand. He doesn't have a, he doesn't have a very good arm. I'd say historically, a guy with his physical attributes, average athlete at best, very average arm, forever, just because you played at a big-time program, a lot of people, those type quarterbacks typically didn't get drafted that high. I think he's a third or fourth round quarterback in the history of the draft. But these last, what do you think? Five, six, the quarterback inflation. And let's face it, Bill was really desperate. He had no backup plan. Hell, even when Tom left, he had to sign Cam in the summer. So Mac, did did he truly want Mac or did he just need a quarterback in three years later? The other thing, and we talk about this a lot, the clock in football now is rapid. This is not, I'm giving you four or five years. Thanksgiving, second year, I've been told. By Thanksgiving, by the second <laughs> yeah. year, so you've got about if you if you started your first year, you got about twenty six starts. You're around there. People are making decisions upstairs. <laughs> They're raising their hand, or that's why the Daniel Jones thing is a mystery because I think one person raised their hand. It was the owner. I don't think anybody else in the yeah. room wanted it. Well, it's why that you know the Steelers get talked about right now. Should they be? Obviously, they 
meeting with Russell Wilson, who maybe they're a sleeper to sniff around on Kirk Cousins. It's insane. Like they, they already kind of know what Kenny yes. Pickett has in the bag, and it's it's not great. And Mac Jones is worse than that because Kenny Pickett at least yes. can move, right? Brock Purdy can move. Like you, you got to be able. And this is why I was like adamant. Kyle Shanahan, you cannot draft this guy high because his the root the margin for error with him, like the margin for error with the physically gifted guys. Even Jalen Hurts, like he can play bad and still his numbers look pretty good because physically he's pretty gifted. He can throw the ball. He throws a beautiful deep ball, can run the Herberts. Like Mac Jones had never sniffed those guys' yeah. physical attributes. Yeah, he, he you know, people uh, have rolled their eyes, you know, at the Tom Brady footage, dad bod. But at least Brady was in, looked like he was in shape. There are pictures of Mac Jones. He just looks pudgy <laughs> oh. and doughy and soft. It's bad. Um, by the way, we'll touch on this. Easy pivot here to deflate gate. Uh, so I'm through th- uh, eight episodes. So, um, you know, it's obviously leans more craft uh, family than it does uh, Belichick, who, you know, listen, Bill ticked off a lot of people over the years. There's no question about that. And there's a price to pay for it. Um, but the one thing I came out after watching episode eight, if Mahomes had a defensive coach who almost felt like he was had a grudge once Garoppolo once Kraft stepped in, remember Tom went to Kraft and said, get Jimmy G out of here. It almost felt like the relationship changed. Bill was pissed at Tom, resented it. Um, you know, you can see Bill, like the old Parcells, I'm cooking the dinner. I want to, I want to have the groceries. And mostly Bill did, but that was the one time Kraft stepped in and said, no, get him out. Even though Brady won the Super Bowl in Atlanta, it was, there was almost a hostility toward Brady. And I was, you know, I was thinking Mahomes is more gifted, but if you gave Mahomes a defensive coach that didn't know anything, didn't know the language, uh, especially early in his career, I don't know. I I think my takeaway after episode eight is Tom's resilience is remarkable. He got the verbal shit kicked out of him for 20 years. And at the end, because of the Garoppolo move is my hunch, Bill was just not nice to him. Like like all those rings and all that money and that legacy, and you're not getting that with 99% of the quarterbacks, is that I thought to myself, Christ, if I had a boss like that, I wouldn't last 20 years. I just couldn't. No, I bad. I mean, if you're natural, and I, I've defended Bill for the last couple months of him not getting a job, which I still think is insanity. But if you're a natural curmudgeon, angrier, negative guy, as you get older, you usually don't get happier. <laughs> so I also think, listen, society and the world we live in when it comes to sports, because of the money, the power of the superstar has, football's never going to quite be the NBA. But Jalen Hurts talks to Howie Roseman. Patrick Mahomes texts with Veach and Andy all the time. And I'm not talking during this. I'm talking in the offseason. You know, he, he, one of the big parts of uh, Ty Dunn's article was like, God, Sean, you need to work a little more with yes. Josh Allen. Right. This is you want to. Why wouldn't you want some of their opinions and be on the same page as them? You go as they go. So I I think that's at the forefront of kind of the world we're in right now with quarterbacks in their front office. You want to be tied at the hip and be, I would say, just your relationship is much more unique than all the other players who still have the old school, a little bit of a widget. Like if you're not playing, we'll get rid of you. We can replace you, you know, beside what? 50 players in the NFL, the Aaron Donalds, the Trent Williams, but they're few and far between. Most guys, I, I've been in these meetings. You're constantly talking, can we upgrade here? Is this guy worth the money? Can we draft a guy in the second round to get 90% of the value? And in three years, he's way cheaper. But the quarterback is not that spot. It's why you see, you know, Baker Mayfield get a lot of money because what else are they going to do? Kirk Cousins going to get a ton of money. That that position, you know, Bill, he became a star right in the 80s. I mean, you, you I, I don't remember it, but... Obviously, his game plans against Bill Walsh, it was a different time. I mean, Bill Walsh was always trying to get rid of Joe Montana. <laughs> Bill Parcells, you know, him and Bill Sims were just screaming at each other constantly. The, the quarterback was viewed as an yeah. equal. Even with Montana, it's like, well, next man up, his back goes, Steve, you're in. And it's just, and that was kind of the world he grew up on, where I think Andy was right at that time in the 90s, the power of Favre, I, I think just looks at yes. it a lot differently. And that, and that's why you think, and you've been saying this, for the transition of, this timing for him is just, it's the ultimate, it's perfect, right? He He's made for this era yep. of football. That's why he's kicking everybody's no, ass. He really is. The, um, you know, and the, the dynasty is, um, <laughs> the other thing my takeaway is, 
that holy shit the most unforgotten play in the history of Super Bowls people just forget about this because of the Malcolm Butler interception people forget that Seattle was dead Russell Wilson throws it up the right sideline <laughs> the announcers yeah. are like bounce off the guy's leg didn't it? <laughs> it's like the great team it's like I mean it really is it's almost the equal to Edelman's catch but Edelman's catch is as it should be noteworthy winning team because of Malcolm Butler's play moments later you for the the if New England would have lost that Super Bowl, they had it done. Seattle was at midfield. It was over. It was well defended. So one of the things I like about sports documentaries is you forget a lot of these stories inside the stories. Like they talked about how Belichick wouldn't call a timeout because they were watching Russell Wilson looked unorganized on the field and Bill's sitting there watching him. He's like, I'm not bailing these guys out. I'm just going to sit here. And I had heard that story before, but I will say this to people on Deflategate, whether you like the Patriots or not, there is, there's, it's storytelling and it's fascinating to hear these players talk and that I appreciate. It. The thrill and excitement of March mania is here. It's one of the best three, four week periods in sports in America every single year. DraftKings Sportsbook, one of America's top rated sportsbook apps is giving fans a chance to bet just $5 and win $150 instantly in bonus bets. With a college basketball bet, you download the DraftKings Sportsbook app. It takes 90 seconds. You put in the code Colin. That's me, C-O-L-I-N. New customers bet five bucks for a chance to win $150 instantly in bonus bets only at DraftKings Sportsbook, only with the code Colin, C-O-L-I-N. The crown is yours. Let's move to Baker Mayfield. Uh, it's three years, $100 million deal, 50 guaranteed. It feels a little bit like the Daniel Jones contract, where it's probably closer to 50 million than 100 million. Your thought on the fit, the contract, I, again, I I don't have a pri Again, this is not the division with Mahomes and Herbert. That's not what we're talking about here. I, I, think, I think it makes sense to me. I think he's actually, you know, he's a little bit of a loose, a little bit of a, he's got a little bit of a, a pirate feel to him, right? Like he's, He's one of those yeah. guys that he's got a chip on his shoulder. I think the fit works. Your thoughts? When the season ended, I would have guessed like three years, 60 million and guarantee 40 or 50. So the, the guarantee would have been similar, but the right. average, you could push back and say the average per year, a little overrated. It's all That's about right. the guaranteed money. And when you factor in so many teams, like you're telling me the Raiders wouldn't have given him a similar number just to kind of get their, you know, a, a, an operation like that. Yes. Get a guy you know can function. I We were talking about this before you hopped on. I think the division plays a huge part where you feel good. I, I was talking to Jason Light at the Combine. They, they, they feel very comfortable with Baker. I think Baker, like you said, feels very comfortable in their operation. They have a lot of star yeah. players who really like him. That, that matters. Right, like, why do the 49ers have so much trust in Purdy? Obviously, he plays well. Their star core trusts him, likes being around him. They value that. Tristan Wirfs, Winfield, Mike Evans, they rally around Baker yeah. Mayfield. So that that's worth you could argue 10, 20 percent over what you'd like that's to right. pay right away. And this is really a worst case scenario. It's a two year deal. Look who he's playing. David Tepper is a fantastic stock trader. He's a god awful right. NFL owner. Right, that that operation is yeah. in shambles. The Saints have Derek Carr and Dennis Allen. And we'll see, like, Cousins, if he ends up in Atlanta, which a lot of people think, he is coming off an Achilles with an operation that hasn't really been winning in the last six. So their players don't even yeah. know how to win. That's the one thing Jason Light talked about. Baker got to come in here with a chip. We have a lot of guys who spent the three years around Tom. So we have the, the winning culture here with our star guys. Like, these guys have been in huge games for three years. And they just rallied around Baker I think if you watch Baker on the right day in the playoff game, awesome. I watched him a lot during the year. I'm like, oh, I'm not same. really seeing it. New offensive coordinator now. Yeah. Uh, I, I get it. A little rich for my taste, but totally understandable. You, you, they, what were they going to do? Let them walk? What, what, they're drafting in the mid-20s. They, they don't have any other yeah, options. Yeah, and I think there, there is something to be said about um, Baker got you know a little bit of the crap beat out of him by the media in Cleveland. And I do think he's matured. I really do. I think Baker's grown up. And I think he's one of the things I've always said about Baker. He's smart. He's great on the whiteboard. He can read a real defense. Um, Sam Darnold got a second shot, right? In, in Carolina. 
Baker yeah. Mayfield throws a better ball more consistently than Sam Darnold. I don't think he's quite the athlete, doesn't move as well, but he moves okay. For me, I, I think to your point, the division matters. Um, I mean, again, I'm not paying Derek Carr if it's Herbert Harbaugh, Andy Reid, Mahomes. I'm really uncomfortable paying him a lot. In that division, I mean, the NFC South has been probably the weakest division in football 10 of the last 20 years. I mean, it's like a, it's like the yeah. SEC. I don't know what it is. Is there less revenue to te- to fans care less? Are the owners not very good? It's just not a very good division. It's just, you know, some of it too, John, is passion. There have been down years, but the Giants have Super Bowls. Washington has Super Bowls. Uh, the Eagles have Super Bowls. Um, you know, I mean, all these teams, the Cowboys, the Eagles, that division cares because college football is irrelevant in the Northeast outside of maybe Penn State. For sure. I do think in the South, Saturday is such a big day that it's just, there's not, if you listen to sports talk radio on a Monday, they're not crushing the NFL team. They're, they're ripping their SEC head coach and quarterback. And I do think there's a, you know, it just doesn't feel as big. And so that division to me is best quarterback wins it. And this morning, this afternoon, Baker's arguably the best quarterback. And one thing, if you're Jason Light and Todd Bowles, you go, well, Baker, sneaky bright lights guy, right? Oklahoma yeah. three years, excelled couple years into Cleveland, played really well that one season and, and won a playoff game. So you've seen him have success in the league. And then last year had, you know, eight to 10 really good games for you and played well in the playoff game against the Eagles. And he, he wasn't terrible in the Lions game by any means. That was kind of an ugly game, but made some plays yeah. down the stretch. So you've now seen him in two playoff games. You clearly feel comfortable. You got a year with him studying how hard he prepared. You, you just, you go from $6.85 million though to thirty five. You know, do you get the same level of chip on your shoulder? Some guys excel. You know, not everyone's Michael Jordan and Tiger Woods and Tom Brady. They can have a chip on their shoulder till the day they die. Some guys ebb and flow with that a little bit. So I, I do think there's going to be some pressure on Baker next year. So everyone was counting him out last year. This year, everyone's going to celebrate him. We'll see. I, I, I still think Tampa. Well, I guess we'll know with Kirk Cousins in the next couple of days. But I, I'd still give them yep. a very, very good shot to win that division, yeah. wouldn't you? Um. So there's a couple other things to uh, talk about. First of all, the Broncos traded Jerry Judy, who I always, I never, Jerry Judy's one of those guys, Cortland Sutton, I think is a little underrated. I think Cortland's a really good player. Um, and I also think they have a young tight end I like. They have a back I like. Um, they got to make some moves here. You know, they're they're eating money. So they trade Jerry Judy. They cut Justin Simmons. You know, um, you know, six, six months ago, everybody was lamenting how we treat running backs. But Seattle cut two, got rid of two good safeties. Justin Simmons for Denver is a really good safety. Nobody wants to pay a safety. So, I mean, I, I think I think you see what they're doing here. They're like, listen, we just we got to get we have to get we have to hit on six draft picks. The only way to make that whole Russell Wilson thing work, and it can, you get Bo Nix at 12. You hit on four to five other draft picks, and it is amazing how you mitigate cap problems. Uh, you know, you're you're. But look at the Rams last year; they had a bunch of cheap talent. That was good. A great point. They hit on the tackle was great. Both their defensive linemen, the edge, and the kid from Wake Forest, the D tackle was good. Outside of the Stetson Bennett pick, and I think he had some mental. Yeah, Luka. everything else worked. Who can everything else? Everybody was productive. So if Denver goes out and gets a quarterback who's functional, I think Bo Nix works in their system, whether he's great or not, I don't know. Or a JJ McCarthy, if he hits and you have, you know, four other um picks that play, I think I I, I don't think it'll hurt them for a year, but I don't think it's one of these um death knells. I think it, that's what's great about this sport. You start accumulating picks. It's a numbers game. You hit on six or seven, you get through stuff like this. Well, ultimately, if the Yankees sign a $300 million contract and the guy sucks by year two, there aren't ramifications because you can keep buying other guys. In football, when you sign a $160, $170 million guaranteed deal like they did with Russell Wilson, and it's a disaster, there are massive ramifications. Yes. There's a tidal wave. So it's the trade, when you look at the collateral damage of the trade, it's not just the picks they gave up to Seattle, which Seattle hit on those guys, and the players they gave up. You have to include all these guys they cut, right? Because they had to free some money. that They had to be able to breathe. So, like, I, I listen, you know, I don't know Sean Payton, but I, I can't imagine he doesn't want to cut the safety. But Jerry Judy he probably would have been yeah. traded no matter what. But they cut some guys because they yeah. have to get money that they need to kind of balance everything out. So to me, the Russell Wilson contract, you saw the title. These guys getting cut or, and traded are part of that. 
the Buffalo Bills, same thing. To a lighter extent, they gave Von Miller fifty-five oh, million dollars. Cr- it's that a was disaster. A crazy so they're move. cutting all these guys. They're cutting all these guys. Well, that the ramification of they can't cut Von Miller. It'd be twenty-five million dollars on their salary cap. So they got to cut high. They got to cut Poyer. They got to cut the center. It just that's part of the deal. It's why you know these front offices and football's hard because if a guy gets injured. But Von Miller was 30 plus years old. I understand the Russell Wilson deal at the time, but like they're paid to get it right and they got it wrong. And let's face it, they wanted they wanted Aaron Rodgers. That was yes. what they did. And then the moment he went back to Green Bay, they were so desperate that they got over aggressive to John Schneider when he's sitting in his hotel room at the combine, George Payton, a couple years ago. And, and he gave him the farm. John, John Schneider tried to trade Russell Wilson. Remember in 2018, he wanted to give him to the Browns to draft Josh Allen. And the, and Russell said, no. So they, they made a huge swing and, and they also, and listen, I understand why they did it. They, they were all in. They didn't have to give him a contract. He, he was under contract when they traded for him a couple of years, but they wanted to get him up there and they thought he was going to be a star. And it Think backfired about that. in of, epic proportions. You know, it's interesting. I'm in the take business and I, you know, I have strong opinions, but there are times, and I always try to, I don't ever say anything I don't believe, but the Russell Wilson Denver Seahawk, nobody won. Pete Carroll got fired. Hackett was a disaster. Russell didn't work. Peyton now is under the gun. Players are getting moved. You think to yourself, well, Seattle. Schneider, Schneider kind of well, won, didn't he? Because he got to take over Seattle. That There you go. John Schneider won. And he hit on those picks. I mean, let's face it. Pete when Paul Allen died, there was this moment in time that Pete had too much power in the building. And like a Belichick, he had too much influence. I was told by two different people in the building over the years, Pete started kind of taking over the draft. John Snyder threatened to go to Detroit, said, uh, there's no, what's the point? They bring him back. He takes control. The drafts have been great in Seattle since. These coaches, you know, they 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 hate to admit it, but they don't watch football on Saturdays. The, the, they're not oh. sitting around on Saturdays watching these. Andy Reid will tell you that. I, I'm. I don't have time. And so when you all of a sudden you want to be a man, the, the GMs I know. I mean, I know Tom Telesco, Brett Veach. Saturday, they're sitting watching college football for hours. They're going to games. You can't be. You can't enter late on that stuff and go. Well, here's some film. You got to watch the games. Andy told me at the combine, and he's done the job head coach GM in Philadelphia. He said, it's not possible anymore. There's too much time or, or there's not enough time. You're spending too much time on your own team for six months to attempt to catch up. And then when you attempt to catch up, you, you kind of, you end up, most guys probably cut some corners instead of watching five games on a guy. You got to bang them all out in two months. You're watching one or two games. You don't get a great feel. If you, if you have confidence in a John Schneider, in a Brett Veach, in a less need, let them do their job. They spend 365 days, even during the season. And I've been in the, you know, in, in from Monday through Friday, the general manager will spend some time. He go to practice, evaluate his own team, watch free agents. He also watches draft picks. I'm talking September through December during the week, right? Evaluating like his scouts are doing. They're funneling him. So by the time the season ends or you get to the playoffs, he's watched probably the top 150, 200 guys on yeah. their draft board and has a really good feel for him and has and has evaluated all the reports on their character. He knows these guys pretty well where the coaches come in kind of blind to the combine, meet the kid for the first time. Like, how about this guy? It's like, well, this guy can't really play. I know he's a great personality and it kind of gets convoluted that way. So these best organizations are able to kind of split it. Or even if the coach, if he's making 12 to $18 million, he's the highest paid guy in the organization. But he's willing to give, like, hey, we shouldn't do this, coach. And he listens. And anytime that you're not willing to listen, let's face it, it happens a lot around the league. But Belichick wouldn't yep. listen to anybody. And that, that was a huge downfall for him. And he's had really excellent personnel guys throughout his career in the building. But he just How won't listen. He, one he of his won. guys, Nick uh, Cesario, 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 New yeah. England of Houston, first draft, he aces it. <laughs> he's crushed he crushed it. it. <laughs> um yeah. Okay, so let's – I thought about this. So you're Russell Wilson. You're a star in the Pacific Northwest, but you're kind of geographically isolated. Then you're going to be the culture setter. You're going to be the, the man in Denver. Disaster. So he has visited the New York Giants and the Steelers. So I think he's a really good fit with the Steelers. He doesn't have to be the culture setter. They've got Tomlin. It's an organization that I think has historically drafted and developed pretty well. 
They have some really nice personnel at wide receiver, running back, tight end. You know, O-line is what it is. It's not terrible. It's not great. And you think to yourself, that's a better fit than the Giants. Could I argue this? That go look at the Super Bowls. Go look at the playoffs. Defensive coaches, they're not getting there. Is that the Giants, you're entering. Great entry point. It's like being a morning show on a radio station. You don't want to replace Howard Stern. You want to replace like a guy that is awful. And so any success yeah. feels big. So the Giants have been irrelevant for about 12 years, roughly. One double-digit season, 12 years. You have an offensive coach. You have a very good left tackle. You have a star back, but you actually have some pieces. You have a pass rusher. You have a decent defense. Uh, I like the GM. Now, the coach is a lot. But he is an offensive coach, and we have seen him. I think Daniel Jones, I think that he got into the playoffs, is a fairly remarkable achievement by any coach. Would you automatically say, if you're Russell, take the Steelers better organization? Now, they don't have the same GM they had for years, so it's a whole different ballgame in Pittsburgh now, many suggest. Giant Steelers, is it as cut and dried as we think that Pittsburgh's the better fit? I would be begging the Steelers to hand me that one-year veteran minimum contract aside. I, I, I wouldn't touch the Giants with a 10-foot pole if I was Russell from the sense of he has no equity in that market. That You talked about a pressure cooker that if it's still ugly, he would be getting crushed, that the magnifying glass on that division, right, playing the Cowboys, playing the Eagles. Now Washington is going to be much more competitive. It's the highest-rated division in the league, so everyone's paying attention. And if it continues to be ugly – I don't know if their team is good enough to overcome that. And it could really just, it could end his career. Well, I have a hard time, even if he just is average now. Well, the Steelers have been competitive with below average right. quarterbacks. So if he's just average, they could be competitive, right? To me, the Giants, I mean, Colin, they they were really, really terrible last there, year. There, and it was, they, they lost their quarterback to a There's an ACL. argument. It's, it wasn't like every guy was. There's an the argument. Team. Daniel Jones. And Saquon's probably gone in free yeah. agency, you would think. You know, I guess you never know. The but I said this signed, last but... week on the show. The Giants, Daniel Jones without Saquon Barkley, only Carolina's offense is worse. That, that is a disaster. That is the bottom of the well. Um, yeah, I mean, it, here's the thing about Pittsburgh that, you know, I go back to this. I really like their roster. But, um, and I, I tend to think that, T Tomlin sort of lets players. I mean, we've had Levy and Bell. I mean, I, there's like eight different players, including Big Ben, that were dramatic. There's always drama. It's always with their offense. It's never with their defensive players. It's always with. So my takeaway is Tomlin just not pay attention to offense, which Russell could say, "Great, I'll run it." Or you know, the he walks into a building where they all their money. It's they all spend it on defense. The number one defensive spending team in the league. How do you view the Steelers as a quarterback? You know, Kenny Pickett can't play, we think. How do you view the Steelers as an operation for a quarterback? Well, to me, if I'm Kirk Cousins, I'd be very interested there. I, I think that would be a place, right? I mean, Atlanta, I'm sure, can give him more money, but that's a place where you could win. And that is, I mean, they, they have, they've been, you know, kind of a disaster relative to their standard. And they've still been making the playoff. They've just been a one-and-done team. So that they have a bunch of guys... I mean, they have really, really high-end players in T.J. Watt, Minka Fitzpatrick. They have a second pass rusher. Cam Hayward's still around. Like you said, they always have skill guys. The running back duo, Najee Harris really came yeah. on at the end of the season. Warren, the little back, yeah, really good. good. Uh, I, th th there's a chance. What if Russell's not really functional in this modern-day NFL and the way he's playing now? These coaches want you to have more than the one read ability. And every single person, I watched five guys come on your show last week. It's like, well, he one read. All the guys around Denver watch every play takes off and you watch him like where's this Russell and maybe he was always doing it he was just such a spectacular athlete and such a you know instinctive playmaker you get older you're not quite as quick twitch you lose your confidence a little bit and it's hard to just maintain that style of play forever Steve Young said this 35 years ago to sustain quarterback play you've got to learn to play in the pocket right and that's how a lot of these guys play forever in their older age where he, it feels like, aged overnight because you can't just run around well, and freelance. also, it's pretty telling. When Sean Payton took that job, he wanted it to work because he knew the ramifications if Russell didn't, which is dead cap hell. So, and it it felt like to me almost in camp, like it it didn't work. 
you know, stop kissing babies. We're not doing the, I mean, Sean got real curt and real short with the media. So my takeaway was he's looking at all this film by the time camp, he's watched every snap for Russell. And my take is Sean just said, this doesn't work. I do think that lifetime, how many lifetime politicians ever change their tune? They they always act like that. And Russell's always kind of been this feels like a caricature of something that he's trying to put. And maybe that's just actually who he is, but he's been like this pretty consistently now for a decade. I don't ever expect him to just be, Oh, he's one of the boys having some beers with the old line at the, uh, at the burger joint. Like that's not where we're Tom and, and Peyton. And a lot of guys, I mean, Josh Allen, Lamar, all, all these guys just really resonate with no their question. teammates. Even a huge thing with Jalen Hurts, when they Wally Pip uh, Carson Wentz, it was like, guys just liked him. And there's always been this weird gap of like, Russell's a little more famous. Why well, I could see him being interested in New York, the brand, all that stuff that comes along with it. And that's always feels like with Russell Wilson, there's this kind of element, which when he's playing great, who cares? You deal with it. It, it drew, drove Seattle a little nuts, but they were always competitive. The moment that turns, it, well, it feels like I don't even want to deal with it. I, I could see some of these teams. Listen, everyone gets desperate. You eventually pull the trigger, but I, I don't know. I mean, remember that once upon a time, Cam Newton was just sitting there in a the summer. Are, are we sure Russell Wilson's a lock to be signed by the end of this week? I We'll see. I'm very fascinated to watch how this well, thing plays out. And, and listen, for the first time in his life, yeah, we kind of want you. These teams aren't going to be kissing his ass. Well, you think about this. It's really, um, somebody had a good line, they say, on my staff, said, is he more concerned with sponsorships than relationships? But there is never, been, even for bad quarterbacks, Zach Wilson may not have been popular. People didn't publicly hammer him. Jay Cutler was a bit of a pill. People didn't publicly hammer him. Aaron Rodgers, uh, you know, trickily very well liked by players. Russell got hammered by Seahawk players. He just got hammered by Carl Mecklenburg. Um, Pete wanted him out. It didn't work with Peyton. That's almost unheard of for a two Super Bowl, one Crazy. trophy quarterback where people taking, I've never heard any teammate bag on Tom Brady. I mean, Peyton Manning was intense. I just, some of the, like I said before, if, if there was a documentary tomorrow, on Russell Wilson, you'd name it. There's something about Russ, whatever it is. It just, the Seattle had four different players come out and take shots at him. Well, we, we've seen a couple guys, like guys that had high end careers. When it ended, it, it was clearly they were holding on for dear life. Philip Rivers and Matt Ryan, right? And Matt was done, done. Philip was not quite the same, but he was functional. They were beloved in the uh, Philip Rivers that one year in Indy. You know Ballard; those guys loved yeah. him. And there, you either have it yeah. or you don't when it comes to interacting with people. And the quarterback position, I think a lot of these guys get it early on, like in high school, maybe even junior high. That natural, everyone's kind of looking at them, and it just grows your confidence, and you're very comfortable doing it. When you look at the history, like Dan Marino, just go throughout the list of names guys drafted high, not even like Hall of Famers, Carson Palmer. They just, they just kind of get it. The the crew of guys we have right now. I mean, how natural Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, uh, Lamar, the, their ability to just the, the respect's even the wrong way to put it, but like that's my guy. The all the whole the kicker says that the D line says it. All the offensive yeah. guys say it. And Russell's really kind of an outlier, high end player. He's no longer, but even in his prime, where it didn't feel like everyone there was a gap there. And I don't know what was missing. I, I don't know the guy personally, but even the guys that know him personally always felt like it's just weird. It's like, he's not giving you his number. You got to call my people. It's like, Russell, I'm sitting right next to you in the locker room. <laughs> it's so effing weird. So uh, Philadelphia Eagles, uh, Fletcher Cox, great player. He There was some erosion last couple of years. He retires. Jason Kelsey, not much erosion at all. But if you play center and you're the architect of the tush push, that you, you age fast. Um, I don't love Philadelphia this year. Uh, first of all, uh, there's no proof, and I do like Jalen Hurts, but there's two Jalen Hurts. There's the Shane Steichen calling plays Jalen Hurts. Then there's the rest of his career, and there's a lot of turnovers and a lot of average. Um, they had to hire two new coordinators. Sirianni, to me, feels at times over his skis. You know the organization well. You know, I, I said there's there's always – the NFL is getting more predictable because it's more quarterback coach-centric. 
So Houston was clearly a surprise. They hit in a the coach, they hit in a the quarterback. By and large, Cincinnati would have been good at Burrow Place. There were no big surprises last year. I mean, the, the Chargers went ass over tea kettle because of Brandon Staley, but nobody liked him anyway. Yeah. But, uh, and then Trevor Lawrence got hurt. That was the pr- Jags were playing with the quarterback at about 60% strength. Um, but we have minimum four and on average six new playoff teams every season. It's gotten as high as eight. I said, I think Washington with cap space could be an interesting team. If, the, if Jaden Daniels comes in or Drake may, and they can play a little bit, there's going to be some, they got some good players. Um, I don't love the feeling around Philadelphia. Now they'll pivot quickly. If, if they're, if they're struggling at Thanksgiving, they'll make a move. Oh, so I, I don't, yeah, I don't love you're, you're losing. It almost reminds me when the Patriots lost Brewski and Vrabel and you replace them with young guys. And you're like, Hey, these guys are good players. You no, know, you lost the soul of your team. And they Patriots, even with Tommy came back the next year, they were just a kind of a mistake plague mess. I don't love the vibe for, and I, very pro Eagles on my show, but I don't love the vibe I feel now. Your thoughts? I, I think it's very, very difficult for any organization to replace two guys that have a combined 25 years experience in the same Jesus. building. Uh, both of them, I would say, I mean, Kelsey for sure, Fletcher as well. I mean, guys going to get their numbers retired, be up in the, you know, on, on the stadium, 91 and 65 or whatever number, Kelsey at yeah. 62. I, I think the, the, the pressure, uh, you know, on the barbecue when it's low, went up to high on Jalen Hurts in terms of not just his play, but th- the leadership to run the organization. You had two guys. I mean, Fletcher Cox is a top 15 pick, so he was a highly touted guy, was a really good player. Kelsey, late, bloomer. But these guys have ran the organization yes. for the last seven, eight years. So you lose that, that void, and then you're paying the quarterback $45 million the coach in a little turmoil of like, okay, Sirianni, you got pressure on you. Sometimes when you have a really good organization internally, right? The, the Patriots had it forever. They had Tom, but they also had McCordy, Slater, Hightower, Edelman. Like they, they had a core. You start removing some of those guys. Now the pressure goes, well, you lose Fletcher Cox. Okay. It's on Jalen Carter that has a ton of question marks just as a human, let alone the player. Can he sustain Jordan Davis? These are two highly touted high picks. Okay, can you guys become the next Fletcher Cox? Because he's no longer around, right? And they they always draft linemen. So it's like, okay, they have a really good player to fill in for Jason Kelsey, but it's not quite the same, his void that he leaves from, you know, just verbally. And anytime there's an issue, though the reporters go to those guys. They went to Kelsey, or Fletcher Cox last year when everything was imploding. He's like screaming at the reporter, like, calm down, that's bullshit. Kelsey always could just simmer the moment. And in Philly, yeah. you need that. It's why the Russell Wilson thing in New York, I'm like, that That pressure is a lot different in Seattle and even Denver, which is a high-level organization in terms of its coverage. It ain't New York. And, and Philly is the ultimate. And, and you just to me, anytime you factor in a huge quarterback contract, I, I think the pressure on Sirianni, but on Hurts next year, is just you You could argue the, the, the combo right going into the season with like McCarthy and Dak. Like the level of like, let's see, this is just not, not you're not going to fire Hurts after the season because of the contract, but We've seen them move on fast from Wentz before, so he he better play really well, like a Pro Bowl level, or they're going to have problems. And the leadership. It's not even just the play. Like, everyone's now looking at you like – it doesn't always feel like he's super verbal right. on the sideline, right? And it was reported, like, they're kind of working on that. Uh, well, now he doesn't have a choice. Yeah, and I think there is something. He's a bit undersized. Tua's a bit undersized. Kyler's a bit undersized. Russell Wilson undersized. Tua has been the only one that's acknowledged. Yeah, at times I have trouble seeing – down the field a little bit. So I think with with Hertz, the two my two takeaways are the undersized quarterback generally are not end up being the great pocket quarterbacks of our time. Secondly, they get banged up a little bit more because they have to create alleys and they move more. I yeah. I swear to God, the last two years, I'm not sure if Jalen Hurts has had a three week stretch where he's been healthy. I think he's always hurt. Well, the other thing is last year after the contract, clearly he didn't run as much. No question. I mean, it's pretty obvious because early on in his career, he, it's one of his great attributes. He's not the fastest, but he's very natural with the ball yeah. in his hands. But I don't care who you are, whether you're built like, you know, a, a, a little truck or whether you're super skinny like Bryce Young. If you're running a lot, you are going to get hit and you're going to get hit hard. Yeah, this league is not, you know, John Lynch and Steve Atwater hitting you. 
these guys are still hitting you pretty hard. And they were, we've never had faster players on defense. So clearly the wear and tear, not enough typically to like knock him out for a month, but I wonder if he's just in a lot of pain. But how do you balance? He's probably never going to be, I mean, he's never going to be a top two or three pocket no, quarterback not. in the NFL. But his, when he's playing really well, he's this hybrid player. Well, what happens to all these guys? As they age a little bit and the money comes in, they don't, I don't even blame them. I don't want right. to get tackled down the field, but you have to do that to be a great player. Like Lamar is pretty unique. He's so fast, he can avoid, yes. and he's really good at getting down. Most of those guys don't have his like. Or Josh Allen speed. is so big that he just, you know, like it's big band. And we'll see how long that's, that's right. going to last, right? So I, I think Jalen, I would just live in the moment and we got to run him but be smart about it. But I need him running a little bit more because the pressure on their offense now, this with removing Kelsey, they're going to have to obviously be a lot better than they were. And Kellen Moore had a lot of success with a younger Dak. You would assume Fangio, but like you said, this organization, they work at rapid speed. <laughs> they are not like, let's just give it a couple of years, see how it goes. Like They will pivot and they will. Yeah, no, they're fast. the opposite of the Steelers. They don't let stuff bake. They're not really interested. That's why Pittsburgh's so fascinating to me because, um, you know, I mean, like I remember talking to a general manager when Kenny Pickett was coming out and he said, listen, Pittsburgh needs to find a quarterback. He's the best one in a terrible quarterback class. And I was told he was a top to a middle of the third round guy. That's just what he is. Well, that's what he looks like. He just, he doesn't have a ton of confidence. You know, he's, he's the classic. He could win you a game if he had to start for two mid season, but by and large, God, Mason Rudolph came in and at least threw the ball to the right people. It felt like he limited yeah. as he is better arm talent, got the ball to Pickens. It's like, gee, it's not that hard target that guy 13 times, get it to him nine. You're going to score some points. So, you know, it, it, it's funny. Philadelphia is a, the, the kind of organization. Um, after a while, you know, like the Rams are very progressive. They are just always taking swings. And that's just how less need is. I know him pretty well. And McVay, that Stan Kroenke there, they take big swings. Um, Green Bay, a little more reluctant to do that stuff. Let it bake. Pittsburgh, let it bake. Um, you know, I was sitting there flying. I was in Chicago this weekend. As I flew back, I thought, at least I know what those teams are. Like they have a, they have a, you know, Rams aggressive, San Francisco aggressive, Dallas, they draft and pay their own. Pittsburgh, Green Bay, they let it bake. The Bears don't have an image. And so they really don't. And, and I was thinking about this with Caleb Williams. Anybody with a functional brain, if your kid was going, it was a quarterback, a star quarterback, and was going number one, you wouldn't pick the Bears. But here's my thing, that I think he's going to end up looking a lot like Kyler Murray and Josh Allen year one, where you're going to have no doubt in your mind He's an NFL franchise quarterback. He's just going to lose a lot. And that's kind of, and a lot of that was Kingsbury, probably not a great head coach. Josh Allen, let's be honest, he, was, he wasn't he was nearly as slick as Caleb coming out of Wyoming. He was kind of a turnover-prone mess who completed 55% of his throws. Give me yeah. your belief. First of all, I think the division, I think Green Bay, Minnesota, um, and Detroit, the coaching staffs are good. I mean, I'm sorry, they are. I think Eberflus feels like a coordinator. Give me realistic numbers on Caleb Williams for a franchise, again, that doesn't even really have a brand since the 80s. I would say this, their roster, in one thing, just every single move that happened in the yeah. NFL, it's so evident that the money flowing in has allowed these teams to pay all these people so yeah. much money. I mean, the Bears make that trade for Sweat, immediately pay him. Then they franchise Jalen Johnson and immediately give him a ton of money. Their, their talent on defense is pretty good. I mean, we saw them down the stretch defensively. They're pretty solid. They have DJ Moore. They have some solid offensive linemen after last draft. Uh, I, I think the question just is the organizational pressure on the coach that if you start a little slow, because anytime listen, the, he was losing games last year at USC, tight games, like it's, it's hard. I mean, you, their team's not going to be as loaded offensively as a lot of the teams yeah. are going to play. I mean, Green Bay and Detroit are clearly better. So what happens if they start three and five? Is there pressure to fire Eberflus? And are they already going on another coach? I, I would say, 
I think he's going to be pretty solid because a lot like a young Jalen Hurts and some of these young, they'll just run around. So you can, and he's not going to be afraid to do it. He was doing it all yeah. last year. So as long as he's willing to do that, he can make plays because his arm is so great outside of the pocket. And, and that's an, an attribute that he brings to the table immediately is the scramble ability not to yeah. run, but Deshaun Watson had this early in his career and he does not have the arm that Caleb Williams has. He would, and Russell did this, made a career out of this scramble behind the line of scrimmage to keep a play alive and then yeah. hit a big play. I, I think that's what he's going to have to make a killing on early. And luckily he can't. And that's where a lot of players, they look good early on Deshaun Russell. And then as it goes on, they don't want to keep playing like that. And it's like, can you, and if he can develop into it, then he'll be a top 10 quarterback. If he can't, and there are some questions. Some people think he's not good in the construct of an offense, but you watch all the SC games last year. I did, it was such a mess. That's it's hard to even, I, I know physically he has the gifts. People think he's pretty solid. I know there's a lot of pushback about his team and the brand and the money. Well, it's college football now. I mean, he's been how much Caleb Williams make the last couple of years? Ten million. If I if I was making ten million as a college kid, I'd need a well, team too. I don't this know. This is what going I really. If you take the top four or five teams in college football over the last several years, Ohio State, Michigan, Georgia, Alabama, take those kind of teams. Um, you can argue only one USC player beyond Caleb Williams would have started for those teams offensively, Jordan Addison. And on Ohio State, they have so yeah. many good receivers, he may not have been the number one. Is that when people look at those numbers at USC, there is a sense that they have this, this. They really have had very average. I mean, Jerry Rice's kid is probably a fourth or a fifth round receiver. Really worked hard. Absolutely an NFL player. Doesn't really separate. But in, his, in the league now plays zone. Everybody in the league plays zone. So he's a smart kid. He finds openings. He's got a little puka Nakua where he's strong physically in zone coverages. Dad's a legend. He's a smart kid. He always finds crevices. That's really Puka's. Puka's big and Puka in his own league because Puka's not a huge separator. Yeah. The truth is Puka just finds good hands and finds space. So then breaks and breaks tackle. tackle. So does Cooper Cup. The Rams have big receivers. And Brandon Rice is strong. But that's where I'll defend Caleb is that he had one star player, like one high end player. He was carrying, I mean, Arizona arguably had more. Should have won that game. Arizona had more high end offensive players than USC. Arizona Wildcats, a basketball school. So I, I think it's going to work. I think he's going to look a little bit like Josh Allen, um, or sometimes he's running just to run and it'll look a little, he'll, he'll be a combination of both. He'll be a better – Kyler was a better thrower right out of the gate than Josh. Josh was just bigger, stronger, and insane. I think he's going to be a hybrid. He's going to be a little bit of both. I, I do think a lot of times when you get drafted with the first you know, overall yeah. pick, you go to a team, even if it has an offensive piece or two, the, the Panthers were kind of an outlier. They had nothing. The defense usually stinks, so you have to do – like th their defense could be pretty good. Right. I mean, they, they got some high end defensive players. Eberflus might not be a great head coach, but he's a pretty yeah, good defensive yes. coach. So, what if they're just, it, it might not be on his shoulders like it is a lot of times with these young quarterbacks because their defense is getting shredded on a weekly basis. So, I, maybe it's actually going to be a little easier in the sense that his defense in the pros well, is going to be way better than anything he experienced in, in college, Oklahoma or USC. The Lions will probably have to give Goff a bigger deal. Jordan Love's going to get paid. So those defenses, that's not a great defensive division. So so the no. best defense next year, arguably, will be the one Caleb Williams faces at practice. So once you pay golf, sure. you can't go out and spend the money. And and by the way, most of the really, really good players for Detroit, Amaron St. Brown, Panay Sewell, Goff, Swift, you'll pay in three years. You're gonna you're gonna retain your offensive players. They don't have Hutchison is the one defensive guy you'd pay. So my take is Caleb's coming into division. He may have to win by shootout, but this is not going to be the a AFC North, you know, or like when Matt, you know, no. or, or honestly, when, when Tua came in uh, or, you know, I mean, you had Belichick twice a year, you've got McDermott, you know, at one point, hell, Brian Flores was in that division. It's like, Oh Jesus, that's, those are tough matchups. So I think Caleb's going to go in a division where most of the talent it's an all-star team offensively. There's not seven great defensive players in that conference. And I think Sweat and Jalen Johnson are two of them. Sure. I mean, they're really good. One thing last week, I I, uh, I didn't watch that much LSU 
during the season, and I, I just flipped on. I wanted to watch the wide yeah. receiver, uh, Malik Neighbors, who's supposed to be a top 10 player, and obviously the, with the quarterback. I came away thinking, Jaden Daniels, geez, he, he actually really good pocket yeah. touch, big arm, big time athlete. I started texting around to a couple college directors. I said, is this the number two quarterback prospect? And I, every single one of them hit me back. Yeah. When it's all said and done, they, they think he's – because it gets back to, is it, is it going to be a great NFL player? Nobody knows, right? But you might as well take the guy with the more physical gifts. He's got a big arm. He's really accurate this year, and he can move. Oh, he's, you can tell he's really yeah. skinny. He but he's tall. He's, six, combine, he's like 6'4". To... Exactly. So if it, over the next couple of years, he can get up to 205, 210. Let's say I'm assuming maybe low 190s right now. He'll be fine. And he's really fast. But again, arm-wise, very accurate, throws a very beautiful deep ball, and has a powerful arm. So I came away thinking, that guy, th there are actually some similarities there. I wanted to hate him just because what I watched at ASU was so ugly. Sometimes you get that initial, you, you watch him play a couple games, you're like, this guy couldn't play. And then you watch him, what he did this year with Brian Kelly in a real operation. Like, this kid looks like yeah. a star. Obviously, he won the Heisman, but from an NFL prospect, I wonder if the gap, clearly Caleb's going to go one, but I, I think physically he, he brings a lot to the table. He's not as thick as Caleb, right? I but mean, he's Caleb almost, is, uh, is, almost uh, four inches taller. He's taller. Much. Yeah, that, taller. that's a much easier. Yeah, to he see. didn't have much to work with at Arizona State. He played with a running back. It was kind of, you know, it was Herm Edwards. So it was most of the yeah. attention and the athletes. Uh, Antonio Pierce and Herm Edwards were on the defensive side. He had a running back that was pretty good. He didn't have a ton to work with. So O-line wasn't very good. But I remember um, when he went from Arizona State to LSU, I went on the herd on FS1 and Fox Sports Radio, and I remember saying, he's good. I, he can play. Um, I remember his first couple of games. My daughter went to Arizona State, so I was kind of like, you know, I, I and I knew Herm. So I was kind of like, ah, I'm going to watch this. And Jesus, was he – I remember this first start in college. I'm like, you know, Arizona State games are at night because it's so hot. So you have to make a, you have to yeah, make yeah. a point to watch them. They don't, like, fall into your lap. Yeah. There's no day games, right? So I would stay up and watch him, and I was like, "Shit, man, he may weigh he may weigh one sixty, but he throw. If you go back to his first year starting, he had total poise. He absolutely looked like yeah. the best freshman quarterback in the conference. So now you give him LSU's protection, and you give him an offensive coach. So you know, you know, how sometimes you look back and you go, "Yeah, of course Lamar Jackson was going to be good. He was moving all over the field against Clemson." I think you're going to look at Jaden Daniels and go, he was moving up and down the field against SEC defenses. I don't know if you saw this story, but I was looking a couple hours ago that Bob Myers was in the, uh, went to the combine and was in the interviews for the quarterbacks. Did huh. you see that? And I, and I the can Warrior imagine GM. a lot of people in the NFL. Yeah. yeah. The former Warrior GM who helped them he consulted with Rick Spielman to kind of hire Adam Peters and Dan Quinn. I think a lot of people in the NFL, their natural reaction would be like, what the fuck's this guy doing in there? And then I started thinking, well, he kind of knows what it looks like, right? What guys sound like, what makes them tick. He's been around, I don't know, I mean, one of the greatest NBA players and one of the greatest athletes yeah. of all time. And Draymond and Clay, I'd say, had pretty unique careers uh, from a success yeah. standpoint. I was like, That's, I, I think Washington, it, it's going to piss some people off because the way they're doing it's a little differently with Bob Myers and thinking outside. That. I, I think they got a lot of high-level people. I, they're league. my surprise pick in the league, Nick. They're my Houston. I think they're going to surprise people. I could see Jaden Daniels, good draft. They got some money, buy some players. They already have some young talent, right? They got some yep. draft picks, trading yep. Chase Young, trading yep. Sweat. If they have a good draft and the quarterback is just solid, he doesn't even need to be C.J. Stroud, but it's just in, in the running for like a rookie of the yeah. year type player. Why couldn't they well, be... Eight also, to ten wins right away. You're, you're seeing Philadelphia losing some of these Vrabel, Brewski, heart and soul guys, Kelsey, Fletcher Cox. Um, Dallas is going to become very top heavy because they're going to pay Dak, Micah, CD Lamb. Everybody else, I mean, there's just – and, you know, Dallas is very reticent to go pay somebody outside the building. They love to draft and pay their people. <laughs> That's why they never have any money for free agency. <laughs> their team, they always pay yep. their own guys. And then I think the Giants are a mess. I just don't think – I. Again, I'll say it, Brian Dable getting Daniel Jones into the playoffs. And we're going to look at that in about a year when Daniel's not a starter and just coach Jesus. Yeah. So, no, I think <clears> – <throat> and, you know, the, the, the reality of this league is if Jaden can play – and, again, a lot of starts, two different conferences, two different styles of quarterbacks. To your point, he moves. Most of these guys that move well by themselves about two years 
of the light going on. Russell Wilson told me this. For sure. All these running quarterbacks, Mahomes said year three, the light went on. You're like, oh, everything slows down. Well, that's why pocket guys like Mac Jones. No, you don't get those two years. That's Jared Goff, by the way, his first year when he had a bad old line. Couldn't run for, to save his life. So I think I think Jaden, even if he's not great in the pocket, will move enough. They're going to buy some offensive line pieces. Terry McLaurin. They got some backs I like. I, that's my surprise team. I, and and again, they brought the guy Adam Peters from San Francisco, who I I know of but don't know. But when's the last time somebody came out of that Niners operation? The Rams and the Niners, McVay and Shanahan. They hire. Guys hang around for a few years. Now, Brandon Staley didn't work as a head coach. But by and large, the hit rate on Niners and Rams assistants and people in the building, not a lot of failures. Almost all these guys hit. Yeah, pretty good. Well, because you can't function in the building. You know, one, it's a little more inclusive, right? It's got some Andy Reid characteristics, like everyone's communicating with each other. And clearly, you're around teams that are pretty high level at a lot of different positions, so you know exactly what it looks like. Didn't you think, I mentioned this earlier, but the amount of money these teams are throwing around, I mean, the Bears just probably gave out $60, $70 million over when they signed Sweat and then Jalen Johnson, and they are not some big money team with just Dallas Cowboy, you know, David Tepper level money sitting in the bank account. Everyone has so much money now in the NFL that, oh, I want to give Baker Mayfield 50, you don't even think about it. And historically in football, people were, half the teams in the league were hesitant to give these big numbers. They didn't want to get stuck. Now no one's like, oh, it doesn't work. We'll move on next year. The money <laughs> flowing with this television deal has made the league, which is good for fans. Most players, if I if the team wants to keep them, yeah. they stay. Well, that's what I said. I mean, $95 million guaranteed to Chris Jones, who's probably at the end, near the end of his peak. He's probably got one or two more peak years. Yeah. But I, and I, I do think um, when I looked at the salary cap move up because the gambling money and the TV revenue my take was this is really going to help the good teams. So Baltimore has that For defensive sure. lineman. They're just sweating. Pay, pay him. him. Give him $80 million Chris no Jones, you're like, God, how do we get, pay him? <laughs> All the good teams. I mean, you know, it's like Aaron Donald. The, the Rams go back and forth. Aaron Donald was the number two interior defensive lineman, according to PFF. It's like he may be kind of the Brady of defense. Like, like Fletcher Cox, you could see erosion. I don't. I, yeah, it wasn't. The I same didn't. Guy. I. I thought last year. I was like, if the Rams get another pass rusher on the draft on the edge, so you, it's harder and harder because the first kid worked. Aaron Donald looks like he is still a top three defensive lineman in the league. So I. I think to your point, the money's just flowing now, and I, we've talked about this before. Is. <laughs> It, 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 the NFL is so big now. It really feels like hockey in Canada. Everything else is just a stepchild. It, it's English Premier League in London. Sure. Like nothing else. They have cricket. They have tennis. They, it just doesn't matter. And I think, I think gambling has. I know at Fox, people don't turn off bad games anymore. You stick around. Nobody. These bad games used to have. You'd have, they'd fall off the cliff. They don't. They just stay. And also the other thing is. The big brands, <clears throat> Green Bay is good again. If Chicago gets good, Philadelphia is always good. The Niners are good. The Cowboys are, you know, they're winning 12 games with Dak. The Steelers underachieve, but they're okay. Right now, you got a lot of Midwest teams hitting, which is, you know, I don't know. I just look at the NFL and I'm like, I remember five, six, seven years ago when I was hearing these Northeast sports writers say, oh, the CTE, it's the end of football in America. And I'm like, guys, Stop going to baseball games. Football is not going anywhere. Well, th- this next week is NFL free agency, which is big, but I actually think it's kind of the opening act for the draft. I mean, can you imagine how big the draft rating is going to be? Chicago, uh, Washington, <laughs> and Boston draft one, two, three. I mean, think how many. I mean, I bet it, it's going to 15 plus million people are going to be watching night Thursday oh, night. Oh, I bet right? you. I bet maybe that might be low. It might be 20. Thursday 25. night draft night will beat Knights of the NBA Finals. No question. Oh, easily. Honestly, it might, with with those big brands drafting high, and he stretches it out for 35 minutes, might be 25-plus million people watching the first hour of the NFL draft. I mean, it's just going to be insane. I can't wait for it. Uh, John Middlecoff, former NFL scout, his podcast is three and out. We do this for an hour or so. Tonight we went over it, which is great. Uh, good seeing you, buddy. Like I said, keep an eye on the Dodgers. I I think they're going to be pretty good. (laughs)